just uh, a couple of housekeeping notes uh, before we uh, move forward. And, um, and so uh, first thing is uh, some introductions. Uh, who are your hosts today? Um, I'll uh, start off with uh, Mark. Uh, so Mark, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and then I will um, introduce myself as well. It's my pleasure, Karen. Thanks so much for having me and thank you all for joining today. So my name is Mark Brousseau. For the past 25 years plus, yeah, I'm old. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have been specializing in marketing and business development and product management and research in the areas of document intensive business processes. So accounts payable, accounts receivable, healthcare payments. If you have an inefficient, ineffective, paper driven or document driven business process, I'm your guy. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about how it is that organizations can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of their accounts payable processes. Thanks for having me, Karen. Oh, indeed, our pleasure, Mark, and uh, certainly a delight to have you uh, join us today. And uh, it would be great to learn a little bit about your expertise and uh, your thoughts and insights into um, you know, some of the best practices that we're going to talk about today here in this webinar. My name is Karen Wainwright. I am a channel account manager here at Duap, and Duap is a invoice automation company. So we do um, uh, AP automation. Uh, that's kind of the long and short of it. But I've been working with uh, Microsoft partners and customers for well over 15 years now, and I uh, certainly love the business. Um, you know, when I fell into the AP arena, I just, um, believe it or not, I kind of came alive. And um, and so I'm also a certified accounts payable specialist. That's with IOFM, which is the um, Institute of Finance and Management, a really good organization to uh, join if you haven't already. And, um, and actually, Mark is um, on the other side of Pennsylvania in Center City, Philadelphia, whereas I'm on the other side of the state in Pittsburgh. And so there's a little bit of a sibling rivalry going on there, right, Mark? That's right. But we won't hold it against you, Karen. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to, um, we're just going to go through a number of different PowerPoint slides. We're going to kind of speak um, sort of like in a podcast format. We, you know, we don't want to kind of get bogged down with slides. We want to express the, the five uh, best practices in much more of a conversational format. So here is our agenda today. Uh, we've got five uh, AP best practices. Uh, we've got, you know, the anatomy of an invoice, which I'll be going through and having a conversation with Mark about um, all five of these. And um, and so you'll also see the um, the app dog, and um, you'll see some sheep along the way too. And just to kind of explain a little bit, bit, bit about that, um, the sheep, in our opinion, are the invoices. All kinds of sheep everywhere. And and it's our job as the do app dog, as the software, uh, to go ahead and uh, kind of corral those those sheep and kind of organize them. But one thing they should be very aware of today: this is not a sales pitch. This is not a conversation about do app. It's a conversation about best practices. So just want to make everyone aware of that. I know that in these days of COVID, there are a lot of sales pitches these days, and we wanted to kind of get away from that. And we wanted to give some sort of news you can use in your AP uh, or uh, operation or or your AP uh, department. All right. So, um, you know, one thing that um, is important to us is being able to use statistics and use actual data um, when we are talking about best practices. I happen to extract a lot of details out of Arden Partners, uh, which is kind of like a think tank for a number of uh, finance uh, topics. Uh, this, a lot of the, the statistics that I have for you today uh, were from a 2020 study. Uh, so this is all uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty recent. And, um, and so Mark, I was just kind of curious um, you know, some of these uh, priorities and challenges, is there anything that sort of stands out to you in your, um, in your practice and in your experience in the AP world? 
Yeah, you know what's happened, Karen, is that the shift to work from home has exposed and exacerbated a lot of the shortcomings with the way we've been doing things in accounts payable for a long time. So when we look at what it is the top challenges are in AP departments here, Arden defines it as, you know, workflows that take too long, too much manual intervention, mm. too much paper. Well, the thing is, is that as bad as it was pre-March, now... Mm -hmm the problems have become even worse. So when I talk to accounts payable practitioners, what they're telling me is, is that now that they've gone to a work from home environment, it's become much harder to approve invoices in a timely manner. Ex exceptions have become even more onerous to resolve because now it's harder to chase down information. It's harder to get suppliers on the phone or to even get stakeholders on the phone to right. be able to get the information you need. It's harder to see what's going on with your invoice status. So all told, when you look at the challenges that Arden lays out here, chances are they've gotten worse for right. organizations. And the thing is, is that you can't let this fester because the new normal is probably going to be a lot like the next normal. So mm -hmm. there's no telling when we're returning to the office. There's no easing insight to the cash flow pressures we're under, to the spend management pressures we're under. Senior management's going to ask you for more, even more visibility into what's going on. And you're going to be asked to do more with less. So if these were challenges you were facing earlier this year, the fact is it probably gotten worse mm -hmm. and you don't get a mulligan for letting them go because of the shift to work from home. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, Mark, just to let you know, I was speaking with a customer not too long ago, um, an AP practitioner who was meeting the CFO in the parking lot to do approvals and to do other paperwork. And also, I know we're going to be talking a little bit more on the invoice side today, but also to sign checks. And that is just Oh, there's got to be a better way, right? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there has to be a better way. And this is the thing. So what we've done as a result of the sudden shift to work from home is we've created a lot of workarounds, right? Mm -hmm. So in many cases, we hear of organizations that are doing the types of things you explained. I've heard of organizations that are driving invoices around town to get from approver to approver. I heard of one organization that's sending a check printer and check stock home with a trusted employee so they could make uh. supplier payments from their house. Now, those are fairly extreme examples. But one thing that a lot of people in the line are probably doing is using email today to mm -hmm. route invoices around their organization. That can be just as extreme as some of those examples I gave. Now we don't know where things stand. We don't have visibility into where those emails are in the process. We don't have any escalation procedures, any alerts for invoices that are approaching their due date. So while you might be using emails and think it's getting the job done, the question you really have to ask yourself is this, are those workarounds really working? And in my estimation, the answer is probably going to be no. Right. And if you're using email to onboard your suppliers, the one thing Karen and I want to tell you today is stop doing <laughs> that, for goodness sake. That's I really know. risky. Really risky, Karen. I know, Mark. Stop the insanity. <laughs> mm, my goodness. So, so chances are your workarounds aren't working. So what are you going to do about it? Oh, exactly. Well, you know, there's um, there are a lot of solutions out there, and it all depends upon what works for your organization. But you know, you can stop the insanity. You can, you know, have a, a great process, something that everyone is um, is you know relying upon. Everyone's on the same page, and and great. Uh, so whether we have COVID or not, um, you're set up uh, for. A, to have a great AP organization. Now, the one thing that we find a lot, um, and Mark, I'm sure you'll agree on this, is that sometimes the AP practitioner thinks, well, you know, I'm just the AP practitioner. What am I going to do? Well, there's a lot you can do. And um, actually, there's one little uh, quick point that is not part of our agenda today, but, you know, we can even help you build a business case. So if you do want some type of software, you do want some type of solution, something that you want to uh, get from upper management, 
we'll help you even build a business case. So I kind of promised no sales pitch, but if you want some help on the side, we're more than happy to help you out because we want to stick together as an AP family and be able to make this, make, make our organizations as strong as possible because you know, if there's, there's power in numbers, right, Mark? That's exactly right. You know, Karen, to your point about I'm just an AP person, um, this has been the trap that AP leaders have fallen into for years. For years, accounts payable mm -hmm. was the quintessential back office function. We were the people in the basement with the hand-me-down office furniture and the coffee mm -hmm. pot that didn't work so good. People only called accounts <laughs> payable when things went wrong. Well, uh, something funny happened on the way to the forum. And it goes <laughs> back to the last financial crisis we had back in 2008 if you remember. What really exacerbated the financial credit meltdown was that corporate America didn't know where they stood with their cash. And that was largely because of the backward ways that we were managing our accounts receivable and accounts payable functions. Data stayed trapped on paper. And so we were never able to get good visibility into what was going on with our cash and our spend. CFOs swore that they never wanted to allow that to happen anymore. So what we've seen is, is over the years, the strategic value of accounts payable in the eyes of CFOs has continued to rise. And today, the vast majority of CFOs believe that accounts payable is strategically important to the business. It is the hub of that information that CFOs and controllers and VPs of finance need to understand what's going on with cash flow and to go on with spending. So accounts payable leaders should think of themselves as that hub of information. They should be striving, Karen, to build an intelligent function that can provide this information to the organization so that the organization can achieve its strategic objectives. And right now, the thing that CFOs are most concerned about, of course, is liquidity management and cash uh -huh. flow analysis. And the best part is, is that accounts payable practitioners, if they can get at that data that flows through the department, can really serve that up. 60% of senior finance executives are more receptive to the idea of accounts payable automation today than they were seven months ago. They know that the way that accounts payable departments are running today is not sustainable. They know it's not giving them the information they need as senior finance executives. So chances are you're going to find senior management's more receptive to automation. Your challenge as an AP leader is presenting them with a business case that frames out the accounts payable proposal in a way that's going to get them excited. Oh, absolutely. And you know, Mark, they say that cash is king, but cash can't be king with the kingdom collapsing below, right? So if the, if cash is going to be king, it needs to have power. That power comes from a great foundation. That's right. Cash is king, but data is the trump card. Oh, you know, there you go. <laughs> I don't want to say like a gambler here, but the fact is, is that without the data, that cash in the bank really doesn't mean a lot to the business until we can understand it in context. So what you want to do is you want to automate AP to give context to that, to your cash flow. Absolutely. Well, thanks. You know, great insights, Mark. I appreciate that. So what we're going to do is, um, is we're going to do um, our first uh, practice, which is anatomy of an invoice. And um, essentially, you know, this is how, uh, an invoice should behave properly. So what does it look like? What should you do with an invoice? An invoice is not just a piece of paper with some information on it. There's a lot more to it. So um, so let's dig in. And uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a breakdown. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you're gonna see kind of the classic um, invoice and the way that it should look. And one thing that we're finding is that the AP practitioner is getting a little bit more bold. They're getting out there, they're speaking with their, their suppliers and they're saying, okay, listen, I need to have my invoice in a specific desired format. And why is that? It's because I'm going to automation. I am uh, improving my processes. I need to uh, clean things up. So I always say, ask and ye shall receive. And you're never going to get an answer unless you ask that question. So it's, a go, it's going out to the suppliers and giving them an anatomy. Say, okay, there are certain things that we do need. 
And um, and also, you know, this is part of your vendor vetting process. And, you know, I was speaking a little bit about IOFM before. Well, with IOFM, with some of their sessions with the AP P2P conference that they used to have every uh, twice a year, now it's all virtual. But, you know, they always, always used to talk about how AP should work with the procurement group a little bit better. So this could be part of your vendor vetting process, um, not only, you know, getting, you know, the, the tin work done and so forth, but, um, but also ensuring that the invoice is structured such that you can use it and use it for uh, things like reporting and automation and so forth, which we'll be talking about um, in a few minutes. So Mark, um, you know, a bit um, invoice inconsistencies are pretty rampant and, you know, this causes a lot of problems for users. You know, how critical is it for companies and organizations to ensure, you know, that there are some guidelines that their suppliers adhere to? Yeah, you know, Karen, the percentage of invoices that result in an exception continues to rise every year. And a lot of that has to do with incomplete or inaccurate data on the invoice. And in many cases, that goes back to the fact that suppliers simply don't understand what happens to an invoice when it's mm-hmm. submitted, right? We, we assume that accounts receivable to accounts payable departments within the same organization talk to one another about best practices. This is, couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. It just mm-hmm. doesn't happen. So how is it that we can stop this, this increase in invoice exceptions? Well, just as you said, communicate with your suppliers. Now, look, the economic downturn has put tremendous cash flow pressure on suppliers. They're looking for ways to get paid faster. So AP leaders have been reluctant in the past to have these conversations with suppliers about what they need on an invoice. Now is your chance. Now is your chance to say, look, if you want to make it easier for us to pay you faster or on time, there's a few things we need. And have that conversation with them. And you're likely going to find that they're receptive to it because they know that anything they can do to grease the skids and get paid on time, or maybe even faster with early payment discounts is going to be in their best interest. Absolutely. And so uh, before we move off of this slide, I just want to make mention um, the, uh, this uh, bullet here where we're talking about number eight. So this is, deals with the cost center. And so cost center um, is a way that you can actually uh, do your coding. So it, it goes to the right, um, the right ledger account. And, um, and then also at the end, uh, you know, Duap is a Finnish-based company. So, you know, Finland does things a little bit differently than the United States. But, you know, in some cases um, on your invoices, you can also have um, the payment details. So what, um, what bank it should go to and the routing numbers and so forth. So this is going to be some uh, critical information uh, moving forward when you do, um, you know, look at the anatomy of an invoice and you structure it such for for your your suppliers moving forward. So the next best practice is um, automatic coding and workflow. And um, and so what we're talking about here is um, is essentially um, you know making sure that the amounts are going to the correct uh, ledger account. Um, but you know that can be a long arduous process for some companies. And, you know, there are solutions out there that will speed up the process um, by using things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, you know, it's, uh, machine learning and AI are much more than buzzwords. Believe it or not, you're using artificial intelligence and machine learning. You know, even if you're on Amazon or you're buying, you know, something off of a website, it knows what you're thinking. And that's, that's you know, what's going on in the world at this point. Um, but uh, it can also translate into your day-to-day operations uh, when you're dealing with AP. So, um, so Mark, you know, what have you observed in terms of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence? Um, do you feel as though that there's, there's increased adoption? Yeah, so we're definitely seeing increased adoption, although I'll say that most organizations are still in that exploratory phase. They're still Mm -hmm. trying to understand how we can use it in our department. In many cases, that's because um, they're they're allowing IT to drive the bus. They're, they're, They're making decisions on a global level. 
The fact is, Karen, is that there's a lot of departmental solutions already mm -hmm. available that are making great use of AI to help achieve some pretty significant operational improvements. So consider some of the tasks in accounts payable that can be automated by some greater cognitive intelligence. Now we can make some understandings about the data that we're capturing for invoices. We can put it in context. We can validate it without the need for a human operator intervention. We can understand how an exception can be resolved. We can route invoices automatically. And then when you combine that with machine learning, this ability to become smarter over time by observing the way that a human operator resolves a problem, now we're cooking with gas. Now we're able to really streamline the accounts payable life cycle and eliminate that friction that in the past led to higher costs, more errors, greater delays and frustration from all parties. So AI is available today in some leading accounts payable technologies. I encourage you as AP leaders not to let somebody else make these decisions for you, to look for solutions that are already using the technology and to see how it fits into their product roadmap. Absolutely. And so uh, before we move off of this slide, um, just want to you know, make mention that consistency is important. Mm -hmm. um, it's important not in terms of, not, not just uh, in terms of of automation, of software, of your processes, but also what folks expect within the organization. Yeah. So when you look at the AP department, it's just like really any de other department in any other company um, or organization. Consistency always leads to quality. And if everyone's on the same page, then life is going to be a lot easier. And then one other quick thing here is that, um, you know, we talk about, you know, rule-based coding and workflow versus kind of the machine learning. So the rule-based coding and workflow, um, it's, it, it's, it's, a man, it's much more of a manual process, whereas machine learning is a, more of an automated process. So you're able to transition um, typically with, with very few uh, disruptions and, you know, no one likes disruptions. There's so many of them these days. <laughs> you know, why, why, um, why see that in the workplace? Why see that when you're, when you're trying to do your job? So my little analogy is, you know, I don't know about you, Mark, but I love to do car analogies. You know, it's like it, we're working with computer operated cars versus carburetors. Now, if you're a, if you're anti car aficionado, Great. Well, you know, sometimes the antique cars just don't work um, in today's modern workplace. Yeah. All right. So just kind of moving on, exception handling. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. We could probably uh, wait till the next slide because we could probably <laughs> have <laughs> we could probably have um, a series of webinars on the things that uh, we're going to talk about next. And uh you know, exceptions are always kind of top of mind today. So the ones that we want to kind of address would be, you know, errors, fraud, and duplicates. I'm yeah. sure everyone out there has seen them and de dealt with them. And um, so, you know, we know this one uh, or these topics are, are pretty important. And um, and Mark, on these topics, you know, how, how does you know dealing with exceptions? Um, you know, elevate the AP practitioner. You know, we've often heard that AP people, AP people think that, you know, they're just uh, the AP people. And we've talked about that a little bit before. But, um, you know, how does kind of corralling these or hurting these, to use my sheep example, um, you know, help the AP department focus on more strategic tasks? Yeah. So typically in an accounts payable function today, chances are your process costs too much, takes too long, provides too little visibility and frustrates everybody involved. And mm. the reason for that is in large part because of this inability to post invoices directly to our ERP, whether it's from Microsoft or someone else. Why is that? Why is it that the number of exceptions are rising each uh -huh. year. I and, have no idea. And, and, and the challenges are that 
we're seeing that organizations are struggling to manage their data, right? Mm -hmm. We really have trouble extracting and validating that data and understanding what it is the the, the, the processes are for approval and getting to the, that approval process. The thing is, is that we invest big bucks in our ERPs and they require us to get data to them as fast and complete and accurate as possible. In many cases, though, the processes that feed those ERPs are pretty rinky dink. In fact, most organizations are either manual or semi automated accounts payable functions. So what you want to do is you want to find a way to make that data flow straight through from receipt to your ERP with as little human intervention as possible. All of the issues identified on this slide really speak to that inability of data to flow seamlessly, touch-free through our departments. So when we have technology that can extract and validate and make decisions on data, now we're able to eliminate these these uh, this friction that occurs in our process. And even in cases where there are exceptions, now in many cases, the technology can resolve those in a fast process. In many of the AP departments I walk into, um, what I find is, is that an exception triggers weeks of back and forth emails and phone calls trying to track down information and collect data and to be able to get things flowing again. With an automated solution, now we can eliminate that process. And we, in some cases, can resolve exceptions immediately with little effort on the part of a human operator. So if you want to free up your staff and you want to be able to get them focused on the valuable things that you want them focused on, like data analysis, vendor master uh -huh. cleanup, and supplier management, by golly, you got to do something about all these exceptions, Karen. Oh, my goodness. And, yeah, I just... Um, it kind of boggles my mind to think that, you know, these these AP practitioners who work so hard and are dedicated to their jobs, uh, you know, are are kind of um, they're they're held back uh, when they don't have this automation in place or they don't have. Uh, the ability to have those insights into their data. Um, you know, Let me put it into perspective for sure. you, Karen. 84%, 84% of the typical accounts payable practitioner's day is spent on heads down transaction processing. 84%. That only leaves 16% uh, of their day for data analysis. But, but, but here's the thing. AP what? managers spend more time each day on transaction processing than they do on the managerial tasks they were hired to perform. We've got to stop right. this. We've got to get AP practitioners and their leaders focused on value-added tests, particularly if we want to help position the business for the comeback that we hope is coming soon. Right. And, and the other thing that kind of um, boggles my mind, too, is, you know, I, I, I could be wrong on this, but are, is it the, the greatest cost most companies and organizations have um, is around labor? Yeah. So, so if, in accounts payable, it represents 66% of the median cost uh, of accounts payable, Liz Labor. So by the way, CFOs get this. So when mm -hmm. AP leaders tell me, well, senior management will never approve a business case for AP automation, I say hogwash. You simply right. haven't presented it in the terms that appeal to them. They understand the costs wrapped up in the way you're doing things. They understand that all the time that our mm -hmm. staff spends on the drudgery of keying invoice data is time that they can't spend cultivating supplier relationships that are gonna result in a stronger supply chain in value added activities for the business. Right. So it's all about that labor. And, and it's something you can control too. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's, um, it's not something that is out there that, that, you know, you can't wrap your arms around, uh, because you can. Mm -hmm. All righty. So let's, uh, let's talk about the fourth one. We're starting to, uh, get close to the end of our presentation here. So, you know, getting beyond the status quo, everyone wants to grow. Everyone wants to, make improvements and and be better, not only personally, but also professionally. And so, you know, um, what we can do is, um, is you know, help uh, with, you know, getting into those automated processes that we've talked about. But the thing is, uh, you know, what is it that you want to automate? You know, are there important pieces and parts that 
have to be automated or things that may be, well, you know, it's just not so important. So it's a matter of, uh, of making your priorities. And so some of the things that, you know, we think about are, you know, is the data already contained in our ERP system? You know, what can we discontinue? You know, who are going to be the stakeholders? Kind of creating a plan so that you can get into those automated processes. And then, you know, thinking about the costs and, um, and you know, working with your suppliers a little bit better. You know, there's one story that we always like to tell about how, well, this is more of a Finland type story, but it could apply to, to the United States, you know, where, uh, where, where we have our operations here at Duap. Um, you know, the, uh, Finland is, our, is our, our headquarters. But, you know, there's one company that we're working with that wanted to have each and every phone call logged um, in the general ledger, um, from the phone bill itself. And so is that something that the AP person should be doing or is that something that maybe could be organized by the phone company? So that's the little things like that. So, you know, there's a bigger story. If you ever want, want to hear the, the ins and outs of it, we'll be more than happy to tell uh, the audience um, offline. But uh, so, Mark, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, the status quo versus automated uh, processes, you know, what would you advise AP professionals to do in, in terms of, you know, creating a business plan to, to maybe sell the executives? We were just talking about that a little bit before. But also, um, you know, are there are other departments that need to be involved, you know, kind of looking at, at the organization as a whole and, because the AP department would be excited about these things, but we still need to get other people on board. Would you like to comment a little bit about that? Absolutely. So first of all, now is the time to reevaluate the way you're doing things, right? Mm -hmm. So so we know that in 2020, everything's been turned upside down and shaken for good measure. This is your opportunity to take a hard look at the way you've been doing things. So the question becomes, how do we do that? Well, the first thing to do is to understand your pain points, to take a hard mm -hmm. look at the way it is you're doing your processes, to chart your workflows. In the old days, I would say, get some of that big brown craft paper from the office supply <laughs> store and fat smelly markers and gather around <laughs> the boardroom table and ask your staff to start charting all of the different workflows for all of the different invoice types that your organization has. Well, you can't get around the boardroom table, but you can use Zoom or some other platform. Brilliant. Do that. So you want to chart out all your workflows. You want to understand who touches our documents, who are the decision makers, and what do they think about the way that these processes are flowing? The next thing you want to do is understand your objectives. So now that we understand our points of pain, what is it the organization is trying to achieve? And how is it that accounts payable can support that? Where's the alignment here? Then we want to gather up our stakeholders and we want to see what's on their roadmap for improvement and how it is that accounts payable plays there. You mentioned procurement, treasury, you better believe is uh, going to want to have a great voice in this moving forward based on the economy. And then we want to put together a project team that's going to put this all together into a, a document that's going to basically lay out what it is we're looking for in a solution. Now notice, at no point here, Karen, did I say invite a vendor in and have them do a presentation because this is all nope. work that you need to do before you ever engage a technology provider. Mm -hmm. You want to set the agenda for yourself and not have someone set it for you. Definitely not a vendor. So now once you have all these pieces in place, you have your project team established, you have a clear guideline of what it is you're looking to achieve, the points of pain you're trying to solve, what it is you need in a solution, now you're going to create a matrix and you're going to go ahead and you're going to measure each product and each vendor against that criteria. Have each member of your project team score each vendor independently. Then you exchange the scores after the vendors have left because what you find is, is what's important to different stakeholders will bias their score. You need to reconcile all that. And then, of course, once you've selected the vendor, now you need to really do the hard part which is change management. You want to make sure that as you're deploying this solution, you put a lot of thought into how it is you're going to measure this change. Make no mistake about it, you can still deploy automation, even in an environment where staff work at home, but you need to think through how that's going to work. What oh, are the responsibilities? What are the training? What are the timelines? 
Uh, one other piece of advice I'd give you when it comes to change management, avoid the big gulp, avoid the big bite. It's very tempting <laughs> to want to prove to the boss that you are right and that you're going to do everything all at once and you're going to bite off a lot. Well, the chances are you might bite off more than you can chew and you can choke on the whole thing. So what you want to make sure is you have a reasonable timeline for rolling this all out. Look for the low hanging, hanging, fr hanging fruit. By all means, do the easy hits mm -hmm. first. There's some transactions that are simply hard to automate. And then finally, you want to make sure you measure, measure, measure. So as you continue to roll out your solution, chart your progress, report back to the folks who championed your solution. Look for ways to achieve continual process improvement. You do all this, Karen, I guarantee you, you're going to achieve the biggest bang for your automation buck. I believe, Mark. <laughs> In fact, you know what, um, you know, when Mark, I think when I first saw you, I don't think we actually met quite yet. Was that one of those um, AP to P conferences? Uh, maybe it was in Las Vegas. And I remember attending a session that spoke just to that. And so, you know, chart your progress, you know, have your metrics, have your, you know, bring out a big piece of paper if you can um, and do exactly those things. So th that's uh Big, uh, uh, a big point of conversation for a lot of um, AP practitioners these days. That's what they're thinking about. And that's something that uh, hopefully you will as well uh, to the folks that are listening today. All right. So we're going to get to our next and final best practice an outcome based approach. And, um, and what we mean by this is, um, you know, what can you achieve and, you know, how can you further, you know, herd those sheep? And the sheep meaning the invoices, of course, and um, and really kind of wrap your arms around the data. Uh, one thing that I think that is really important is, uh, well, let me just kind of tell you a quick story. So before I was really, really ensconced in the AP world, I came from the reporting world. The mark you may not know that about me, and so working with things like KPIs and reports and dashboards and all those types of things, and um, and so the AP practitioner, the and anyone actually in the in the line of succession, so meaning the AP manager, the controller, the directors, the VPs, the C level, um, everyone can take part in um, in getting those insights into data. So you know the CFOs love it. Um, you know they they are the tools of the trade. You need to have them. Um, in the AP department, um, you know, certainly it's a, uh, a kind of another layer of fraud detection, being able to see, you know, if there are, you know, any issues because you know your data. Um, you know, the auditors certainly want to uh, see this information. So it's important to get, you know, good information in uh, and so you can get good information out. Um, good meaning uh, something that's going to be, you know, valuable to you. And, um, and so, Mark, um, you know, when you're speaking to the C level, you know, the, the C level is obviously an important part of the equation. You know, what do they want? You know, what's important to them? Yeah, there's three things that they want out of accounts payable. One is they want visibility into cash. They want to know mm -hmm. where the organization stands with its cash. So what are my outstanding liabilities? Well, if you're pushing around paper in your organization, we know that you probably don't have a good handle on where things stand financially. Second, they want visibility to spend. You know, 62% of all businesses in the United States want to reduce their spending as a result of the economic recession. The challenge is, is figuring out where we're spending our money and who we're spending it with is easier said than done for a lot of businesses because we simply don't have visibility into that data. AP can help do that if you automate. And third, and this is an important one to not lose sight of, is the C-suite wants to know that they're the organization is mitigating its risks. Ah, uh, yeah. FBI, the, uh, mm -hmm. the CIA, the Interpol, state's attorneys general, who's who of people you don't want knocking at your front door are all sounding the alarm that fraud is on the rise as a result of the way we're doing things these days. And many organizations... We're putting really sensitive information into emails and in Ugh. many organizations we're being duped by fraudsters who are using email to get in our front door and to trick us into making payments that shouldn't be made so 
altogether, whether it's cash spend or risks, organizations want to be able to get visibility into that data. Accounts payable can do it by building an intelligent accounts payable function that serves information and insights up to CFOs and other stakeholders and does it in a way where it's actionable. Well, you know, the one thing that they did not expect in this webinar today is all the statistics that you pulled right out of the top of your head. <laughs> really, Mark, I'm serious. <laughs> and, and so if you look at statistics, uh, that is, a, they are the tools of Mark's trade as a, as a consultant, as a expert in this area. He knows these things. And so the thing that I'm kind of thinking about is, you know, the AP folks should have those same statistics in, in the back of their minds too. And the only way you get those statistics is through data. And, and how it's rendered through the reports, through the analytics, through the KPIs and the dashboards and so forth. So Mark, thank you very much for giving me a little unexpected bonus at the end here. I really love it. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that the, the folks do as well here that are listening. So um, we're just about uh, towards the end of our presentation. And uh, today, right now, we'll just uh, talk a little bit about some Q and A. Um, I'm going to check the question pane in a moment. But if you have a pen, real fast, or you want to screenshot this, um, you know, you want to get in contact with Mark M underscore Brousseau at msn.com, and I'm Karen dot Wainwright at duap.com. And the thing that I would also urge you to do, which we probably uh, should have put on this slide was to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, if you just email us, then we'll be more than happy to uh, send you those links. Mark is a wealth of information. And if you're not following him on social media, well, um, I, <laughs> I can just say that your life is going to be a lot happier and a lot more um, uh, uh, fruitful when it comes to your work in the AP world. So please, I beg every, everyone, follow Mark on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And best piece of, one of the best pieces of advice I can give to everyone today. So let me just kind of check the question pane here. And I see Mark's face again. Hello, Mark. I can see you again. And um, let's just kind of check the questions. Uh, we don't quite have any questions yet. Uh, that's okay. Well, I guess the big question uh, for a lot of folks is again, you know, how can you contact us? How can you learn more? Um, one thing that Mark and I share is a great love for the AP community. And we know lots of different people uh, who can help. For instance, you know, I know someone who uh, deals a lot with fraud, uh, helps um, co companies and organizations uh, really mitigate that. Um, I know lots of people in the reporting space, uh, so that that would be really helpful. Mark, Mark, goodness, you have the biggest, baddest, widest connections of anyone in the world in the AP space. So, Mark, you know, if you contact Mark and say, "Hey, I need some help with, you know, some vendor vetting or." How do I deal with companies uh, or suppliers that are outside the U.S.? What do I need to do there? Um, you know, I, I need to learn more about automation and that topic of of getting people to come together. You know, the different stakeholders and so forth. So the thing that we want to offer you today is is our is our connections, um, and because our goal is to make AP fun and strong, a great community, be able to communicate, be able to really enjoy what we do. Did I miss anything, Mark? I just wanted to just double check on that. No. And, and if you haven't automated, do it today. All right. Great. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, always an honor and pleasure to work with you. Can't wait to see you again. And everyone um, have a wonderful week, what's left of it, and um, have a great holiday season. And uh, thank you for joining today. And as always, uh, be safe and be smart out there, okay? Thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, everyone.